Okay. And it's my greatest pleasure to announce our first um, session now with a keynote from Marie. Marie is working for Magic Lamp, and they have been working on a fantastic um, piece of software, um, which is Maestri Maestria, if I'm hopefully uh, yes. pronouncing correctly, for, for music, which is um, yeah also a great application. And I'm very happy to have her here, and I will hand over the microphone to her for her presentation. OK, thank you, Alexander, for the introduction. And let me share my screen. OK, here it goes. So thank you very much for having me today. I'm glad to present uh, this work that we've done on OMR uh, on this software that is called Maestria. So yes, EI is the French for AI. So that's the, the reason of the name. So it's a deep learning based optical music recognition. Um, so I'll first, uh, say a word about myself to present uh, to present me. So I'm originally a physicist, and I'm also an amateur musician. So well, this is important for for this kind of project. And after my research career in physics, I decided to co-found Magic Lamp, which is a company specialized in research and development in AI. And so apart from my executive function inside of the company, I'm also the head of the OMR project uh, that I will present to you just after. Um, so we, uh, Magic Lamp has a team of 17 person now, so mainly PhDs and engineers uh, with scientific backgrounds. And we are uh, doing research and development in AI for music, of course, but also for a lot of other topics like new, like health, robotics, defense, insurance, etc. Okay, so now let's go into the heart of the subject. I'll first give a very short introduction about OMR and deep learning. Uh, if you are all specialists about deep learning, I'm sorry, I will try to go fast, but in case. And then I'll turn to describe a bit the neural architecture history. So we wandered a bit before uh, converging to uh, an architecture that was satisfying. And finally, I, I will say a word about our score generator since we, yeah, we designed a, a score generator to train our models. Okay, so uh, very shortly, so I'd like to yeah, give an overview of uh, what deep learning is. So you're more used to classical algorithms where you have to define a set of explicit rules to perform a task. And your job as a computer scientist is to determine the rules you give to your computer. To your computer. On the contrary, for deep learning, it's a more implicit approach. So you give directly a set of examples where the task is solved. And so your job is to provide a lot of examples where the task is uh, done, so labeled examples. And these examples can be uh, obtained with uh, real data and manual labeling, or with synthetic data and automatic labeling. Oh, sorry. Um, OK, so what do we expect from uh, deep learning in this case? First, we expect to be able to generalize the predictions to all contexts. So when I say context, it's basically new musical content and also new musical fonts. You also expect to have a robustness to score deterioration or a bad uh, image, uh, a bad image, so a bad scan or a, a bad picture. So it can be bad contrast, it can be geometrical deformation, such as rotation or skews, uh, partial erasure of the score, pencil marks, etc. So finally, you expect a, a greater reliability of uh, the detection of objects inside of your score. As for the pipeline we use, I guess, I mean, that's completely standard. So we have pre-processing, then we recognize musical elements, then we group them to uh, reconstruct the semantics, and finally we do post-processes uh, to correct the errors. Uh, and so <clears throat> where is deep learning inside of this process for us? It's uh, inside of the, of the musical element recognition uh, task. Okay, so now, um, now let's Turn to the... One second. Sorry to interrupt you. The question was, are you changing the slides? Oh, or sorry. Okay. Still... Huh. Because okay, so... we only saw the title slide. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, I changed. So perhaps I have to share all my screen so that you can see uh, it. 
Uh, now, can you see the? Can you change the slide for a second? You are still yeah. on the title. Yes. 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 Now. Now. now, now, now okay. okay. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. Very much. <clears throat> okay. So sorry for that. Um, hmm. I have the Zoom bar that is bothering me, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, okay. We, so we can't see it. So the Zoom bar is only for you. <laughs> okay. We, we just see the screen. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. So sorry for that. Um, um, okay. So first, um, let's. Uh, I will give details on the neural architecture uh, that we explored during time. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first one we we tried was a sequential architecture, and in particular, LSTM network, so long short term memory network. For those of you who are familiar with OCR, that's the one that is used for optical character recognition. So reading uh, a page of a book, for example. And the great asset about this uh, sequential approach is that it exploits the correlations between consecutive symbols. The prediction given by this network is directly a sequence of labels. So for uh, an, ex an extract of a, of a text, it's simply the sequence of all letters. And for music, okay, that's basically the same. It's a sequence of uh, symbols. But the special thing about music is that you can have several symbols pile up at the same location uh, horizontally. So you can have notes and dynamics or notes and slurs, et cetera. And yet it's a very simple score that I took here for the example. So this difference between text, so text being what I would call one dimensional, there is only a sequence of letters where our music is uh, two dimensional. So you have a sequence of symbols, but you can pile up symbols uh, vertically is actually a big difference. And the question is how to treat this bi-dimensional information with an LSTM. <clears throat> okay, so uh, to explain what were the problems we encounter with this approach, I like first to give a simple example which is the situation where we want to predict the categories of symbols and not the whole music directly. So if I describe uh, this uh, short piece of music in natural labeling, so I just cut the, the score into slices of, of the adapted size. So we have a clef and then an accidental, the second accidental, a time signature, et cetera. But, the raw output of an LSTM network is a bit more complex. It's what we call a frame by frame uh, prediction. So you, you can't have slices of various sizes. The, you cut your image into slices of the same width, and then it predicts the symbol that is present inside of each frame. So the, the output of the LSTM for this uh, score would be a bit more redundant. So for example, the clef is on three frames. So you have three times the prediction clef, et cetera. And the way to compare this prediction to the natural labeling, which is your ground truth, is to go back to the normal sequence, so the natural one, with a function that is called the, uh, the CTC function. And that does this, uh, this job to, to simplify the, the frame by frame sequence. Okay, now if we want to predict the whole music, which is the point of, uh, of OMR, you have to go to what we call multi-label. Because if you look at the sequence uh, in natural labeling, this time you don't have a sequence of symbols directly, but you have a sequence of lists of symbols. Because inside of some frames, you can have several symbols that are uh, piled up. The problem is there is no CTC implementation for multi-label, at least at the time where we, we were using this architecture. Now it's the case, so we have a, a CTC implementation uh, for multi-label, but well, it was uh, quite a problem at the time. And we had to find a trick to train an LSTM on a multi-label task. So we tried two strategies. The first one was to use a monolabel neural network to bypass this CDC function. So to generate, uh, to, to go from the frame by frame prediction to the natural sequence. Um, and so with this technique, we tried to evaluate the performance of the LSTM directly on the frame by frame sequence. 
So the idea here is to go from the raw output uh, of the LSTM, so with uh, uh, similar to the one I presented before, and use the natural multi-label sequence uh, that we have to make a sort of convolution, I would say, between the two sequences and generate the frame-by-frame multi-label sequence that is expected to evaluate the performance on the frame-by-frame -frame sequence. Okay, so yeah, uh, sorry for the order. So the goal is to create this frame by frame ground truth sequence directly. The problem in, inside of this approach is that there is a small offset inside of the prediction. So for example, here uh, you have a, a visualization of a real uh, prediction of an LSTM on a music piece. <laughs> the colors correspond to the different symbols. And you can see that for example, on the left, you have two yellow stripes that correspond to the two uh, sharps, but they are a bit shifted to the right. On the right part of the score, you also have two blue uh, stripes that are a bit shifted to the right. So this means that the frame by frame multi label ground truth that we expected to create through this technique is not completely re reliable because you have small variation of. Uh, of the of the labels. So the second strategy we tested was to split the multi-label problem into several monolabel predictions. <clears throat> and in particular, we trained five specialized specialized monolabel networks that we align afterwards. The, the, the object that was the cause of these five uh, labels, of course, were nodes because for nodes, we have a lot of information to predict. So we have the rhythm, we have the pitch, dynamics, slurs, and symbols. And we can, uh, we can imagine something else, but that was the first, uh, it was the first proof of concept. For accidentals, we also need to predict uh, the type and the pitch. And for other objects, we just have redundancy. So all five networks were predicting the same label. The good point about that is that redundancy uh, brings uh, robustness to the correction because you can compare your prediction for each frame and see where there are problems and then correct your, your problems. <coughs> but the, um, <laughs> the bummer about this, uh, this approach is that it's unadapted to polyphony. So, I mean, we, we knew that in the beginning, but we were curious to see how far we could uh, go in, into this direction. When you have polyphony, you cannot know in, in advance how many notes you have into chords or how many voices you have into your, your staff or how many staves you have into your system. So basically, you cannot say, OK, I will train N neural network to perform the task because you cannot know how many N you need to take. So that's. That was actually the end of this uh, of this approach uh, for us for LSTM, and we turn to a spatial approach with a masked neural network, uh, in particular uh, UNET architecture. So it's this time it's an architecture that is, is inspired by bioimaging. Originally, it was designed to um, to spot the contour of cells in two microscopy images. And the prediction this time is a probability map for each label. So basically, if you take this score, for example, the masks that are predicted have this kind of, of shape. So here you see each white pixel means that this pixel doesn't belong to uh, the label we want to predict. And black pixel mean that you have a probability one to be inside of the label. So you have a, a whole map with probabilities between zero and one. <clears throat> and you have that for each symbol that you want to predict. The asset of this approach is that it can predict complex shapes. So for example, here on the, on the example that is on the right of the slide, you can see the mask for beams. Of course, beams have complex shapes, so it's kind of useful to have um, a complete map, but it's also useful for curved staves, for slurs, etc. So objects that are not only rectangles, but that have uh, funny shapes. And the question here that was um, our main problem was how to retrieve objects inside of a, a map properly. So for example, here you can see that this beam 
I mean, with your eye, you can guess that it's one beam, but you have two spots. Uh, uh, it's it's cut into, so you have the left part and the right part, and you have to aggregate it automatically. Otherwise, you doesn't you don't reconstruct properly the object. Or here uh, at the bottom of the image, you have some some grayish um, uh, parts that do not correspond to a beam. So if I go back to the original score, it's the second measure of uh, the last system. So you see, you don't have any beam, but on the on the beam mask, you have this uh, this mark. So you you cannot really know uh, if you have signal or not. And so finally, we turn to um, object detection uh, through uh, the retina net architecture. This time, the prediction is directly bounding boxes with the proper label. So for example, here, the bounding boxes uh, indicate the note heads, or here, they indicate the clefts, uh, the armature, the time signature, etc. The asset of this approach is that you directly predict bounding boxes, and it's very convenient because you don't have this step of uh, object retrieval uh, like uh, we had with the unit architecture. And it's also easier to train and more accurate. But what about data? I only talked about architecture, and it's always, of course, very important to see what we do with data. So as you know, to train a neural architecture, you need a very large quantity of data and you need labels that are adapted to your architecture. So for the three we tested, for LSTM, we need the sequence of labels. So this, this, this kind of, uh, of sequence with uh, symbols. For the unit, we need some pixel math. So for example, here uh, you have a, a very clean map with uh, white pixels where there is no symbol in black pixel where there is a symbol. And for retina net, you directly have a list of bounding boxes. So basically, each time you want to try a new architecture, you need to change the, the shape of your labels. And each time you want to optimize uh, the performance of your network, you may also have to change the, the shape of your labels. So now how do we get uh, all these data and all these labels that we have to change each time we want to, to try new architectures? As I said before, we can either use real scores or build a score generator. Both have uh, pros and cons. So the great, of course, feature about uh, real scores is that they are representative of which data you'll have to predict on. And of course, the generator um, create some artificial data, so they are synthetic and then they are less realistic. But as for labeling, if you have real scores, you have to label manually everything. So that's, of course, incredibly tedious. Whereas if you build your generator, you can build an automatic labeling brick that is more convenient. So just, I, I, I'm sure everybody here knows that, but uh, if you take a real score, of course, you have uh, a great number of uh, objects you need to, to spot. So here, for example, uh, I just counted. So on, this, on these two first measures, we already have 75 uh, boxes to predict. So this is a, a huge time you have to invest if you want to label manually and to train on real data. And so finally, uh, there is also a point that is quite important. It's about the variability of symbols. So inside of real scores, uh, you have a fixed variability of symbols because music is what it is and some symbols are more frequent than others and that's fixed. So you cannot really, I mean, you can choose what you put into your data set, but you cannot really bypass everything and have probabilities that you can tune. Whereas if you build your own score generator, you can simply uh, adjust the frequencies uh, of your symbols. So yeah, uh, I already spilled the beans, but we, we chose to, to go for the score generator approach. And that's what I will present now. So just to conclude on this uh, network part, so to compare the three approaches that we, we took, so a sequential approach, mask approach, and object detection, the great point about sequential approach is that it uses the musical sequence and it directly predicts um, something that is another shape of a sequence, whereas it's not the case, of course, of spatial approaches. And also something that, that I didn't really mention, which is that 
labeling is quite easy with sequential uh, approaches because you know what you've put inside of your music. Whereas for the spatial approaches, it's tricky because you need to know, okay, you know what you've put inside of your score, but you also need to know where it's being put by the, by the engraving software. But on the contrary, actually, um, sequential approach and mask approach, so LSTM and units are quite hard to train, whereas RetinaNet turned out to be quite easy to train. And finally, which is the point that made us abandon completely LSTMs, it's an adapted to polyphony, whereas the spatial approaches are compatible with polyphony. Okay, so now finally, um, I'll present some stuff about the random score generator we've built. Uh, I mean, it's only very partial because it's a, it's a, actually a huge work to, to design this generator. So the questions that we had when we decided to go through this, uh, this way was, is it possible to really mimic real data uh, in a convincing way? Can we obtain a good generalization of predictions uh, when we trained on artificial data? And how can we exploit at best the generation process, which is more flexible than having a real data set to optimize performance of the, of the, of the neural bricks? Okay, so um, I'll make a, a sort of pros and cons list uh, about the score generator, which will guide me towards some points I will want, I will give details on. So the first uh, obvious pro of this approach is that you can get an unlimited amount of data, which is always great when we when you do some deep learning uh, architectures. Then you also have adaptable labels since you are the master of uh, of your labeling, which is very convenient, as I said before. <clears throat> and you can also control the label's frequency, at least to, to some extent, because you are also the master of what you put inside of your, of your generator. Of course, there are cons, so the data are less realistic than if you take real data, of course. Automatic labeling, even if it's very convenient, is a very tricky uh, step to, to perform. And the fact that you generate uh, data sets can introduce biases inside of it. And finally, there is also a feature that is half a pro and half a con, which is that, of course, when you create your generator, you always forget some features, but you all, when you spot that you forgot some features, you can also reproduce them and generate a new data set and train again. So that's a bit of a pro and a con. Okay, so first I will say a word about uh, this uh, very important flaw that is that data may not be very realistic. So to try and bypass this uh, default, we implement what is called data augmentation, which is very classical when you have a, a generator of data. So the goal of this brick is to reproduce imperfect imaging condition. So for example, bad or inhomogeneous contrast to reproduce perspective, curvature of paper, blur, et cetera. So all the, the features that can happen when you take your camera and you just take an image of your score. And you also want to reproduce uh, the imperfect aspect of paper and of engraving, because if you use um, a music engraver, you have a perfect aspect of your, of your score and your symbols. And it's of course not the case when you have real engraving. So you may have to reproduce stains, for example, erosion of symbols, smudges, handwritings, et cetera. So, okay, basically we, we've implemented um, a lot of data augmentations to reproduce all these uh, small alterations that can happen in real life. So here you have three examples of, of data augmentation that are performed on, on these generated scores. So you have contrast, you have uh, frame rotation, you have some salt and paper uh, noise, you have erosion, etc. So, and it's only a, a subset of what we can do. Okay, so then um, I'd like to say a word about uh, label frequency because it's quite an um, important point. Um, Neural training is always very sensitive to what we call class imbalance, which means that labels must have close frequencies inside of data set to have a, a, good, uh, a good network in the end. 
The problem is music is intrinsically imbalanced. So just to, <laughs> perhaps you're already convinced, but if you need a, a proof, so imagine that you have a typical system. So let's say we have two states per, per system. We take three measures per staff, three beams inside of the measure, and we take chords uh, with two notes uh, per, per chord and two chords per beam. This already yields 72 note heads for one bracket. So if you want to learn to recognize brackets and note heads, which is the case because you want to recognize all music symbols, you have a, a huge imbalance between note heads and brackets. Okay, this is very crude, but if you take a, an example of a score and you count, you, you have 14 bar lines for one bracket and you, uh, you, sorry, you have one bracket, 14 bar lines and you have 70 note heads. So you can see that there are imbalances at several levels. So the, the key thing here is that it's impossible to learn all the labels together if you want the learning process to uh, go to go uh, and to be performant. So you need to make several data sets for several subtasks where you need to balance labels for each data set. And also actually you need to choose carefully the subtasks that you want to perform. Um, I can uh, illustrate it on one example. So for example, if you have a data set where you equilibrate your node heads, so you will have n uh, whole node heads, n half node heads, and n quarter node heads. Then if you look at the reason marks and you look at what's combined with what. So if you take the quarter node head, you can combine it with all rhythm marks that are here, uh, which uh, of course fixes the frequency of uh, these uh, rhythm marks. And as for the half node head, you can combine it with only this rhythm mark. So this means that without doing anything, you have an intrinsic factor uh, 10 between uh, these, uh, these rhythm marks. Uh, so you cannot equilibrate um, your data set for note heads and rhythm marks uh, jointly. Um, with this kind of observation, we uh, we finally converge to 19 different neural networks. Uh, this number can be reduced, but we, we decided to split a bit more uh, the task to be sure that it was converging fine. And finally, I, I want just to say a word about this uh, pro and con uh, feature, which is uh, the ability to reproduce unrepresented features inside of the data set. On three examples that are that happened to us actually. So the first one is, okay, this score, uh, we were not able to predict bar lines. So we had no prediction of bar line uh, inside of this score, even if the content is very simple and the bar lines are, I mean, they are quite normal. And actually we understood after some time that the problem was that all the bar lines we put inside of the data set had the same, the same width and that the bar lines inside of this score were thinner than the one we had inside of the data set. So the, the solution was simply to vary the width of, the, of bar lines we put inside of our generator. On the second example, so on this score, we had a bad detection of symbols and the cause here is quite obvious. It's because the, the aspect is quite, uh, quite bad. So it can either be an old score with erasure or a bad scan. Uh, if you scan and scan and scan your, your score, so you get this kind of aspect. So the solution here was to introduce a new data augmentation to reproduce this aspect inside of the training data set. And finally, you can also uh, sometimes uh, realize that you missed uh, some music features. So here, for example, there was a bad recognition of time signature because we did not have any time signature with n over 16 uh, inside of the data set. And the solution is simply to add such time signatures uh, inside of the data set. Okay, so I briefly conclude because yeah, my time is already over. Um, just to give um, a global overview of the more detailed pipeline. So we have this core generator uh, that is a homemade statistical generator. Um, then we use uh, a music and gravy software that we script to generate the, the scores. And with this procedure, we know the semantic content, uh, which is very important for labeling. Then we apply data augmentation to, re to reproduce the real-like aspects 
or at least to try to reproduce it uh, at best uh, with artificial degrading. And finally, and finally, you have a labeling step where you have to get the symbol's location and to make the link between the graphics and the semantics. And also this brick can be changed if you want to adapt the label uh, you want to obtain to train. Okay, so this training pipeline uh, is used for musical uh, object recognition. Um, and then you have this nice picture that you can see your result and you use this uh, result and this analysis that you do on the results to change your training pipeline. Uh, for example, changing the balance of the generator or um, adapting data augmentation, adapting the labeling, et cetera. So, just to give you some uh, take home messages, object detection is convenient, but it requires a lot of algorithmics, both for uh, annotation and for object aggregation. It turns out that the statistical generator plus the automatic labeling is complex to implement, but it's very efficient. Um, and also, if you take this couple generation plus split of data sets, uh, it's very useful to optimize the neural architectures that we that we use. And finally, when you go down this road of doing artificial generation, you always need to make your your generator evil. So that's basically um, a regular work that we have to do. And that's the end. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the audience. And um, yeah, if I may take the liberty of just starting it with, uh, so if you have a question, you can know, just raise your hand and then we can go through it. Uh, other than that, I would like to start with the first question. Um, did you end up um, mixing your architectures? Because you said like for some classes you had like one more architecture that you say that worked better, for example, for slurs, et cetera, um, the masks, or, or did you end up just using the um, object boxes? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, ideally we should mix uh, units and um, retina nets, for example, or at least mask uh, a mask network with uh, object detection. We don't do it at the moment, but it's in, pro I mean, we, we want to do that in the future. Mm -hmm. um, Paul. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really nice and uh, really insightful. Mm -hmm. I was, however, wondering that uh, for your music score generator, I think if I understand correctly the images, they, the scores that you produce are not necessarily um, musically correct, no? You focus on having a lot mm. of variety on the scores. Yeah. My question is for object detection architectures, uh, there has been quite a lot of literature that claims that the co-occurrence of symbols in close proximity uh, can cause problems then or can cause statistical issues when predicting. I was wondering if you found that by using um, arbitrary rules, uh, there th this has had some effect on the output of the model or not. Yeah. Um, okay, so the content is completely arbitrary, but we yet we try to follow some basic music rules. So we, for example, I mean, you never have symbols that are close uh, and that shouldn't be close or the order is already respected because uh, we want to, okay, we want to introduce some variability inside of the score, but uh, keep this uh, musical, uh, some of the musical rules at least. Mm, and also, even if we have some bad detections that may be the result of what you say, so a, a sort of very, um, very loose um, way of respecting music rules. Then we implement some post-processing that corrects um, combinations that don't, exi in, don't exist into music. So actually, even if the prediction 
is bad, we have a lot of post processing that are uh, designed to solve this kind of bad uh, combination. So that's our, our way to solve what you mentioned. Okay, thank you very much. If, if I may follow up with another really quick question, how do you deal with uh, very small symbols? In object detection, that's <laughs> that's indeed, uh, you mean notes, for example, all these kind of uh, Or dots or... It's because, or, uh, or... Hmm. Mm. Okay, um, of course, detecting very small symbols is always uh, a pain because it's, it's, I mean, it's always complicated. Um, we... We can, for example, uh, cut some patches and predict on smaller patches. We also have strategies where we group uh, the symbols with note heads uh, they are attached to. So for dots or uh, Lure or all, all symbols. Uh, so this makes uh, wider boxes, etc. So we, we have ways to, uh, to avoid very small objects. Thank you so much. That's actually really clever. So uh, thank you very much again for the presentation. Thank you. Ilona? Hi, Marie. Thank you very much for the presentation. Hi, Luna. I just wanted to know more on what is the reconstruction and the encoding process after object detection, or are you looking at the object detection just on its own? Ah, uh, you mean, oh, OK. Um, no, there is indeed a lot of alg algorithmics after object uh, recognition because you, okay, when you use spatial approaches like RetinaNet, you have to detect um, pieces of information. So, for example, you detect note heads and stems and and beams and dots, etc. So you have pieces apart, and you need to to put them together to recreate real music objects. And once you've your uh, your music objects, you need to aggregate these to 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 recreate the semantics. So there is, I mean, <laughs> I cannot sum up uh, all the algorithmic there is around that because it's it's huge. But uh, yeah, we 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 do progressively. So we aggregate the elementary musical objects to form real musical objects. So for example, group of notes, and then. We, we find some measures and then we look at the rhythm and we correct the rhythm. We articulate the staves to make systems, et cetera. So there is a, a whole uh, bunch of algorithms that are implemented after uh, deep learning. So I've talked about deep learning a lot, but it's only a, a, sub, uh, a sub task of the whole OMR pipeline. So it's more an algorithm um, approach yeah. other than any deep learning happening. Yeah, for the moment, yes. And I've seen that there will be some talks about uh, graph approaches. Uh, that's something we also have in mind for the future. But uh, for the moment, it's only algorithmic. Um, just on another note, uh, is there any partition of the data set um, that are real world scores? No, uh, it's also um, uh, a path that we are willing to take in the future. So introduce. Um, a bit of real life uh, scores uh, to improve predictions, but we've not done that yet. And just a follow up on that one, sorry. Um, do you plan to um, make this data set open source at any point? Um, okay, so I'm, I'm not able to answer this question yet because it depends on our partners. So you, uh, you, you talked about, uh, about them, so it's, it's music we are working for. Mm -hmm. um, so. Not in the near future, at least. Yeah. But yes, this is a very key, uh, I, I'm aware of that. It's a very key point of uh, this process. Thank you very much. Aaron, please. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Marie, really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you can just give us a sense of scale of how many, um, you know, how many examples you, you generate uh, for, for the kind of architecture you're using. You didn't talk about performance or anything like that, but just kind of yeah. roughly, you know, how many examples do you generate to get what kind of performance? Yeah, okay, so um, just to give uh, more concrete uh, information. So we generate um, scores with one system each time. So it can, it can possess several staves inside of the system, but we limit ourselves to one system. And so we generate approximately 10, uh, uh, no, sorry, 20,000 uh, systems for one task.
Cool, thank you. Adrian, please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the talk. I'm just wondering which rendering engine you're using to generate those synthetic scores and are you concerned that the rendering engine itself would have would introduce an inherent bias in how it thinks about rendering? Mm. Uh, okay, so we use LilyPond to to render. Um, actually, LilyPond is great because you can really control a lot of parameters. So we have uh, control over a lot of rendering aspects of the score, which is a reason why we chose this uh, engraving software. Uh, but yes, of course, there are always limitations, and we know that there are some stuff that we cannot reproduce, so we have to either okay say okay we accept that these will never be reproduced or find another way to reproduce uh, this kind of feature okay thank you Yuri, please go ahead uh hello thank you for the presentation uh, i was wondering you said that you have used the LSTM architecture at the beginning and you decided to drop it. But I don't think I quite understand why, what was the reason? Yeah, um, okay. Um, I guess it's also a conjunction with uh, the fact that we didn't have this uh, CTC implementation for multi label at the time because it would have been. Uh, much easier for us to to train uh, LSTM architectures, but also we with the approach we took at the time. So splitting the task into subtasks and align the sequences, we were um, blocked when we wanted to go to polyphony. That's the reason we we dropped that. But yes, there is certainly a path where we could now. Uh, train an LSTM on a really multi-label task and see what happens. So we just, I mean, we had a constraint because we are not doing pure uh, research. We all also needed to to have a product that was functional. So we, I mean, when we shifted to object detection, we we tried to stick to this uh, this method. But it's sure that if we had time to do some fundamental research, it would be very interesting to go back to LSTM and try to do some multi-label training, even if it seemed to be quite hard to perform. Uh, right, thank you. And But, but have, you, have you tried, uh, you, you said there's a problem with polyphony, and I agree that there's a problem, but have, have you tried like somehow linearizing the polyphony, like making the encoding more complicated so that it would be able to represent the music from left to right, primarily, and from top to bottom, secondarily? Maybe something like that. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, really understand uh, what <clears throat> was like if, if you have a chord where three notes are playing simultaneously, you can encode them as a sequence of uh, yeah. the top, yeah. Yeah, have, have um, no, that? no, we didn't try that, actually. Mm. Okay, thank you. Alicia? Alicia, we can't hear you. Hello? Hello. Can now we can hear you. Yes, now we can hear you. Uh, thanks for the for the presentation. Just a curiosity. Um, have you uh, considered maybe in the near future to deal with um, historical scores or handwritten scores or historical handwritten scores? Um, oh. So that we can we can work with uh, scores in archives. Mm. Uh, when you say historical scores, you mean um, like uh, Gregorian scores or something else? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. It can be from from that period of time and up to the 17, 18, or even 19th century. Uh, just handwritten. Oh no! Okay, handwritten is. Uh... <laughs> A very different problem because we cannot use anymore our uh, score generators, so it would be a completely different approach. Um, perhaps there are ways to 
to deal with it, even with a generator, at least doing some transform learning or these kind of stuff. But we, for the moment, we didn't tackle it, and I'm not sure we'll tackle it in the future. Yeah, I understand that uh, all the pipeline uh, can be the same. The only difference is the final appearance of each symbol that should at least feel that it's handwritten because all the yeah. rest of the pipeline, how you uh, locate all the different elements and all, so all these could be reused. So it's just yeah. the final appearance of the, of the symbols. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, perhaps there are ways, but it's a, <laughs> I guess it's a very long past. Uh, but it, it would be a very interesting problem. But for the moment, we focus on engraved music. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. OK, well, uh, I think I'm going to, well, I see more more hands up. Well, anyway, I, I just wanted to do like the last question and close the session, but it's OK. Pavel can, can ask afterwards anyway. Well, first of all, uh, Marie, uh, thank you very much for your talk and for coming here to, to our workshop to, to present your well, your product. Uh, since many of us come from the academia, I have a very well general question about the process of developing uh, a normal product. And, and when you were like talking about the process that you followed, that you first tried this thing, then you try another thing and, and so on and so forth, I wanted to know, uh, do you look for research papers that have uh, dealt or dealt with the same uh, challenges? Because during your presentation, I saw many challenges that 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 I already saw in the papers of the detection using LSTM, uh, synthesizing data for training. Uh, but maybe it's because I'm used to uh, uh, research uh, presentations, but I did not see any reference. In, the, in your slides, uh, I know it, maybe it's a, like like it's not an appropriate question, but I just wanted to know the process in your in your daily work for yeah. for looking out for for references that may uh, or or all these ideas came out in your own in your own uh, office. That's that was my question. Um, actually, the the pieces of algorithm. For which we used uh, works that are into the literatures were not mentioned here. So uh, no, that's not completely correct. So the idea of um, using LSTMs was indeed uh, drawn from literature, but we we've uh, developed stuffs uh, on our own with our own techniques for uh, a lot of times. Yeah, it's more we 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 took inspiration from from the literature but we've uh, the bricks were developed i mean they were all homemade okay thank you Pavel? oh hello uh, i have a very short question maybe i have missed this but i'm wondering whether all the parameters of the score generator are set manually handcrafted oh. actually or is there any learning from <clears throat> sorry learning from from real data like for example the width of the bar lines you said that you had to change it right so did you for example learn what is the average width of a bar line in some realistic data or real data no actually we we didn't do that uh, that systematically so we we rather try to change it and uh just um appraise if it looked like nice or not so we it's uh, quite a, a manual process to um, to feed the, all the parameters to decide what parameters to take and what variability to take etc but it's uh, of course it's um it's guided by uh the experience of how real scores look i see thank you thank you very much Okay, great. Thank you all so much for your wonderful questions. I have one final thing to wrap it up. I would like, um, Marie, if you were to start the project over again, with the knowledge that you have now, mm -hmm. what would you maybe do differently? What were your recommendations to the research community here? What we should maybe focus more on, what focus mm -hmm. less on, etc. <clears throat> yeah, for us, um, I think sequential approach was very interesting at the beginning but it's uh, it's a complicated approach so if i had to start again i would directly go to object detection of course it's very tedious but it's uh, also quite convenient and easy to train so um, i think that's the 
that at least uh, a good approach to to start. Mm -hmm. And, then, and do you think? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, um, there are a lot of algorithms that I would do different with my knowledge, uh, that my uh, my current knowledge, but. Um, I didn't really go into algorithms, so it would not it wouldn't make sense to make mm -hmm. a list of these. Uh, but uh, I mean, would, when you take a look at the overall OMR pipeline, is there any specific part where you say this was the hardest, and this was mm. like? <clears throat> hmm. um, um, I. I think the generator was very hard. Uh, generator plus uh, labeling is a very hard uh, bit of the whole pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. And also the post-processing part is very, very complicated. And that's one of the flaws of the current approach, I would say, for us. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very, very much. It was wonderful Thank to you. have you here. Um, if you want, and if you have time, please stay for the rest of the workshop. I'm yeah, not sure of what your timeline is. And for the workshop in general, uh, we will now take a 10 minutes break. I'll kind of squeeze the virtual coffee break a little bit. And we will continue in like a few minutes after 11 with the first session of presentations. Until then, have a nice short coffee break. Thank you all.